Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Protecting Pollinators, Nurturing Sustainable Communities with Pollinator Gardens. I'm Jen Hawes, Partnership Manager here at Island Press. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistics with you. That the webinar today will flow as follows. We'll start with an introductory and framing presentation by Jody Helmer, the author of Protecting Pollinators. Following that, Alexandra Moch will briefly talk about her IOB project, Pollinator Pathway at North Street. Then we'll hand it over to Felicia Jones to briefly discuss her pollinator project, uh, or her project, Pollinator Friendly Falls Village. After the presentation, Jody will ask the panelists a few questions and then we'll open it up to audience questions where Jody will moderate our conversation. If you would like to submit your questions, you can do so at any time using the GoToWebinar panel um, in the questions tab on the right of your screen. If you have any problems during this presentation, please feel free to enter them into the chat or you can ask them as a question. Uh, following the webinar, you'll receive a link to a survey. Um, we really appreciate your feedback for these surveys, so please fill that out so that we can continue to offer these free events. Um, the webinar will be recorded, so uh, please expect to see that in your inbox uh, soon. So, there you go. I want to give you a little bit of information about Island Press. Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher. Um, we started in 1984, and we were founded on the idea that knowledge is power. And our mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment. We elevate voices of change, shine a spotlight on crucial issues, and focus attention on sustainable solutions, just like we're doing here today. Oops. And IOB is our partner in this. We're very grateful to have them working uh, alongside us on this webinar. Um, IOB helps neighbors grow and implement great ideas one block at a time. The community resource platform at IOB connects leaders with funding, resources, and support to make our neighborhood safer, greener, and more livable and more fun. If you have ideas, we encourage you to submit them to IOB. Um, we are offering a discount on the book today from Jody. We encourage you to use this wonderful code webinar that will give you 30% off. It's a great deal. Um, so if you would like to buy the book, please do. Now I'd like to introduce our panel to you. So Jody Helmer uh, writes about food, farming, business, pets, and health. She's appeared, her work has appeared in Entrepreneur, Hemispheres, Civil Eats, Nat Geo Traveler, AARP, Farm Life, WebMD, Health, CNN Money, and Guardian Sustainable Business. She's the author of four books, including The Green Year and Farm Fresh Georgia. Helmer also teaches writing workshops, offering one-on-one -on -one counseling, uh, consulting, and speaks at journalism conferences to help other writers achieve their goals. When not writing, she grows vegetables and raises bees while trying to keep a pack of rescue dogs and an occasional foster from poking their noses in the beehive and stealing ripe strawberries from the garden. She splits her time between Charlotte and Boone, North Carolina. Alexandra Moch is, has been working for the town of Greenwich for the last 20 years. She is deeply involved in the variety of environmental projects such as waste management, transportation and air quality initiatives, inv invasive species, water quality, soil protection, pesticides and restoration of wildlife habitats. She's a geologist, hydrogeologist and environmental, environmentalist per training. Her love of, to study to, keeps pushing her to explore new areas. She is also a certified soil and wetland scientist, landscape designer, master composter, green roof designer, and certified professional in erosion and sediment control. Her real passion is traveling, gardening, and working with local communities on environmental projects. Felicia Jones has been working in business development and marketing for over 25 years. She has a bachelor's in science and health education and social marketing from Hunter College in New York City and holds a number of specialty certifications, including community economic development. Between May 2017 and October 2018, Lisha was employed by Northwest Hills Council of Governments through a grant to, 
to serve as the project coordinator for the Northwest Connecticut, a innovative in a, in a initiative to bring fiber optic broadband internet services to rural Northwest Connecticut. And she is the, currently the economic development director for the town of Can Falls Village. Felicia and her husband moved to Falls Village in 2005 and became full-time residents in 2012. She serves as the wetland commissioner and is the board member for the founding Foundation of Community Health and the Falls Village Housing Trust Incorporated and the Falls Village Community Development Corporation. So with that, I'm gonna hand the presentations over to Jody. Jody, you're on okay. mute. I am unmuted myself, and now I need to make this my full screen. Hold on. Technology is not my strength, y'all. I'm much more comfortable in the garden. Okay. Um, so when I started working on this book, one of the things that people asked me all the time was, how is the bee book coming? And Oh, you're writing a book about bees. Tell me more about that. And I wanted to talk a little bit about who the pollinators really are, because although honeybees get a lot of the attention, there are actually 200,000 species of pollinators nationwide. And bees are, of course, part of that. But other pollinators include um, butterflies, moths, bats, birds, and other insects. And in fact, um, in North America alone, there are 4,000, almost 4,000 species of native bees. The problem is that almost one in four of those native bees are at increased risk of decline or extinction. In 2017, the rusty patch bumblebee um, made headlines for a not great reason. It was the first uh, bumblebee species in the continental US to be put on the endangered species list. And so I think it's really important when we are having a conversation about pollinators that we're not just talking about honeybees or even just talking about bees that we're looking at the whole diversity of pollinator species that do the work. Why do we need pollinators? Obviously, pollinators um, help pollinate the food that we eat, and that includes everything from um, almonds and cauliflower and cucumbers and tomatoes to things you may not think of, like coffee and tequila and even the cacao plant that makes chocolate. So, um, Pollinators are responsible for about one of every three bites of food that we take. So our food supply would look dramatically different if we didn't have pollinators. It wouldn't mean that we wouldn't eat, of course, because species or plants like wheat and corn are not insect pollinated, but it would mean that we wouldn't have a lot of the foods that we love. And so the food supply is really important, but there are other reasons that pollinators are important too. They contribute to our overall biodiversity. If you think about how the landscape would look different if we didn't have these insect pollinated plants, it would be a major change. And other animals depend on pollinators as a means of food and shelter. Um, and so they, um, they contribute a lot to our environment. The problem is that pollinators are, as I said, threatened, and we're seeing a lot of loss to our pollinator populations. And that loss is occurring for um, three, re four reasons, sorry. And those reasons are habitat loss, pesticide use, invasive species, and climate change. So these are the major threats to our pollinators. And I wanna talk about them a little bit, each one. So habitat loss, we're gonna start with. And that of course is the major focus of our conversation here today is these projects that are helping to build pollinator habitat and that's really important because between 2008 and 2011 23 million acres of native grassland scrubland and wetland were converted to row crops like corn and cotton so this is a statistic that is really dramatic but agriculture certainly doesn't represent the only threat to pollinator habitat if you think about things like housing developments or any other construction, any other time that native plant species are removed in favor of other kinds of landscapes, we threaten our pollinators. So even lawns 
threaten pollinator habitat because they provide no place to, to, for pollinators to eat or shelter or nest in that acre of gra grass. So that's really important that we think about not just agriculture, but all of the ways that pollinator species um, are losing habitat. Okay, so agriculture is responsible for a 21% decline in the amount of milkweed over an 18 year period. Um, so agriculture does present a significant challenge. Um, but it also presents a significant opportunity. So before I get into pesticide use, I wanna talk about the fact that there are lots of opportunities to create habitat for pollinators, and those um, come from farmers who can allocate portions of their field to pollinator habitat, from municipal projects that use pollinator habitat on um, you know, right of ways and other things in the roads, um, and even us, preserving pollinator habitat in our own yards and gardens. And so these individual efforts may not seem like a lot when we talk about the vast habitat loss that pollinators are experiencing. But I had a really interesting conversation with a horticulturalist at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center while I was researching the book. And she said, you need to think about pollinator habitat like a quilt. And every project represents a different square in the quilt. And if we all manage these individual squares, they come together to create this big patchwork of pollinator habitat. And so every individual effort that we can make, either as homeowners or community members, really makes a difference in the overall ability for pollinators to find habitat. Um, pesticide use is also another way that pollinators are in decline. And I think it gets a lot of attention, especially neonicotinoids. They're the most wild, uh, widely used insecticides in the world. Um, they're used on 140 crops in 120 countries. And when these uh, pesticides are sprayed, as they often are, they are taken up by the root system and make the entire plant toxic. So the other way that neonicotinoids are applied is through treated seeds or coated seeds that are planted, but they also provide some toxicity issues. Um, pesticide use has been linked to both lethal and sublethal effects. So I think lethal effects, what that means is pretty obvious. How much of the pesticide does it take to actually kill the pollinator? Um, that's one way that pollinator decline is happening, is these pesticides are actually leading to pollinator death when the um, bees or other pollinators are exposed. But there's also a lot of research that looks at what are called sublethal effects. So what else is happening to impact the pollinators besides death that the pesticides may contribute to? And research has shown that it ranges from things like slower learning and impaired short-term memory to a scrambled sense of direction. And so if you think about that with honeybees, for example, there are bees whose job in the hive it is to go out and forage for food and bring that food back to the hive. So two things happen. One, if they're exposed to neonicotinoids, they may not be able to find their way back to the hive, right? Because the neonicotinoids are scrambling their sense of direction. And so if they can't find their way back to the hive, it means that A, the colony population declines because the bees can't find their way back. B, the bees that are waiting in the hive um, to be fed are not getting fed, and so they can die of starvation. And then if the bees do make it back, they're coming back with tainted um, nectar and pollen, right? Because they've gotten it from plants that have been exposed to pesticides. And so those things may not immediately kill the bees, but they pose significant enough threats that the populations are at risk. But it's not just pesticides. Oh, I went too fast, sorry. It's not just pesticides that represent a challenge. Herbicides matter too. So. You saw that milkweed was in decline because of agriculture, and part of that is because the herbicides that are designed to kill weeds may also kill milkweed, and that's the main host plant for monarchs. And so we're seeing monarch declines pretty dramatically in the population, and part of that is a loss of milkweed. Invasive species also present a threat to pollinators. So what happens is they choke out the landscapes. Um, these invasive species spread incredibly aggressively on their own. They outcompete native plants. 
they threaten biodiversity, and they contribute to habitat loss. Because if you imagine a landscape like this, which is dramatic, yes, but it does happen, um, this, um, these plants kill the plants that the pollinators depend on. Even if you have, uh, so they cause $120 billion in annual damage, which is significant. And even if you have an invasive plant like a Japanese honeysuckle, which does provide nectar, um, invasive species may not have the right nutrients that pollinators need, which can lead to poor nutrition. And so I'd like to think of it as the equivalent of us eating fast food every day. So yes, you can go through the drive through three times a day and get the calories that you need, but the impact that that will have on your overall health and ability to thrive is significant. And that's the same thing that's happening with invasive species. So removing them is really difficult, but it's also really important. And I know that Felicia and Alexander are gonna to talk to you a little bit about their challenges with invasive species. Um, but replacing them with native plants is certainly the best way to go when it comes to establishing pollinator habitat and protecting pollinator populations. Lastly, climate change is an issue. So our planet is getting warmer. We're seeing an average increase of two to four degrees by 2050 is the, um, is the estimate. And along with that, the arrival of spring is advancing 2.3 days per decade. And that may not seem like a big deal, but these changes affect the flowering dates of plants and the seasonal flights of pollinators. And so what happens is the pollinators and plants that depend on each other may not be emerging at the same time. So if the plants are emerging earlier because the temperature is heating up and the pollinators are waiting, when the pollinators come out, the plants they depend on may be dead and that affects their ability to find food. And so that's really important. The other thing that's happening is that pollinators are moving further north or changing their migration patterns to avoid the heat. And so if you've got pollinators that typically live, let's say, in the northeast and migrate to Mexico over the winter, but they're not going that far because of the temperature increases, they may end up in places like, let's say, you know, Alabama, where they are now in increased competition with local species for resources like food and habitat. And so that increased competition affects not only the pollinators that are migrating, but also um, affects the pollinators that live year round in those areas. So climate change obviously is leading them to shift habitats um, and that's presenting um, a whole lot of challenges. We're seeing in some areas, um, organizations like the Audubon Society, which does annual bird counts, is seeing um, people reporting that hummingbirds and other pollinators are staying north over the winter, which is they should not be there. So what can we do? We're going to talk a lot about this today because it's um, the focus of, you know, what we're talking about, IOB supporting projects and these community projects that are really helping pollinators. But at home, there are things you can do like planting habitat, including native species, letting the lawn grow a little longer, let that clover come in. It's often the first food that bees get in the year, and so that's really important. Break up with mulch. Most of our native bees are ground nesting species, and if you cover every piece of bare soil in your yard or landscape with mulch, it becomes very hard for them to uh, create nests in the ground. So it's a good idea to leave some bare soil for them. Provide clean water. As this little bird is showing you, every pollinator needs water. And so that's really important. And it's really easy to do. Avoid pesticides and remove invasive species, which we talked about. Support pollinator-friendly businesses. We're seeing a growing number of um, businesses invest in pollinator habitats and other initiatives. And it's really important, I think, to vote with your dollars and support those businesses and let them know that this is something that matters to you too, because the more people that support pollinator-friendly businesses, the more that pollinator-friendly businesses um, will invest in these projects and the more companies will recognize it's important to do these kinds of projects and hopefully get on the bandwagon. And then lastly, participate in citizen science projects. So there are all sorts of community efforts that allow you to get involved in 
creating pollinator habitat or researching pollinator species so that you can be part of understanding, helping scientists understand what's happening with pollinator species and what moves we need to make in order to better protect our pollinator species. So these are all really simple ways that you can support pollinators in your own landscape and in your own life. And so um, I wanted to just give you a little bit of an overview before we jumped into these specific projects so you can better understand why projects like the ones that Alexandra and Felicia are going to talk to you about are really important for pollinator survival. All right, my name is Alexandra Mark, and I'm going to be talking about the first mile-long pollinus pathway in Greenwich. Oops. Um, and here is uh, our group, and as you can see, it's uh, very strong and diverse, and we have uh, people from um, design, uh, planting, plant growing, uh, very knowledgeable of Sorry, Sorry natural Alexandra, habitat. I can't see your presentation. I'm going to try to take it and then give it right back to you to make sure. Sorry, I just want to make sure people can see you. Okay, hopefully you got a notification. Yes, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, let's go back to our group um, and uh, here they are. And you can see that we have volunteers, we have all sorts of, of environmental organizations who are helping and supporting us. So we are ready to go and very capable. Uh, location uh, for the first, and uh, it's not uh, yet a one mile long, but uh, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And we're starting with a small section, and uh, the purple um, arrow uh, expand over the area which is being under construction right now. And uh, for uh, picking the area of our one mile long pollinist pathway, uh, we decided to um, uh, select an area which is uh, centrally located in Greenwich and is bounded between two schools, one public and one private. Uh, we thought about uh, different environments, not only different ownerships. So in terms of ownerships, we have schools, we have a cemetery on our pathway, uh, we have a uh, privately owned nursery, we have a single family development um, and uh, roads. Uh, also, the, in terms of the habitat, uh, we have large meadow area at the nursery. We have wetland watercourse corridor uh, crossing through the uh, single family development. We have schools, we have wooded area, which we are working at right now. And uh, because of uh, the different involvements, we are hoping to involve the community, local community, and also schools uh, into our uh, pathway. Our purpose is obviously creating a healthy pollinator habitat. And what we're trying to do, we're trying to uh, create connections. And those connections, would, which allowed actually build something bigger, which are the major migratory corridors for wildlife. As Jody mentioned, the climate is changing and it's getting harder and harder for wildlife to survive. They may be able to, uh, or have to, rather uh, migrate a little bit to north because of the temperature changes. So we'd like to um, accommodate this and uh, be forward thinking. Uh, we would like to grow seed source for the future projects. I would like this to be sustainable. It was uh, hard to come up with the uh, money to begin this first uh, section. And now when we're invested in it, we are hoping that every year we will collecting the seeds and we'll create the bank of the seeds and we will uh, keep populating them um, in different areas. Uh, because of the proximity to a school, obviously we are going to be creating a little classroom uh, for our students. 
we are hoping that uh, property owners, when they arrive to our site and walk through it, they will take note of some plants, and those plants will have uh, their tags and names on it. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, they were going to take some notes and um, uh, try to find them at the local nurseries and bring them home and plant them. Um, and hence aesthetics, uh, this area used to be choked with uh, invasive vines and now we're creating this beautiful and uh, flowering uh, uh, meadow uh, which will be pleasing. And as you see on this picture, uh, we have a road very close so it's uh, pretty nicely viewed uh, from the uh, passing cars. We're hoping to uh, do census of pollinators. We'd like to have a better idea who is visiting our area and what kind of pollinators we have and how they are reacting or interacting with our plants. We are thinking of uh, future workshops in this area. As I said, uh, we're going to have a little outdoor classroom incorporated into this area. So for example, we may offer to students uh, working on bee hotels and we will allow them to install their bee hotels in our area and allow them to monitor the interaction between uh, the, the new hotels and uh, the bees uh, in our area. Also, we're going to be a uh, promoting pesticides-free zone. Uh, invasive species were removed physically. We did not uh, use any pesticides. Uh, it was hard, but actually worth it because we are offering this healthy habitat for pollinators and those uh, plants are going to be also uh, be grown pesticides-free. Oops. Uh, here's a little sketch um, and in this rectangular uh, uh, setting you have on the left hand side is the wooded area, on the right hand side we have the street. The green areas are uh, planted uh, with plaques, we use more than 3000 uh, plaques and you can see some of those plants which were planted there. The empty areas, the white areas, are the areas which uh, needs to be planted and we're going to be planting them in fall. Also, uh, the circle, green circles, are trees which were there and we embrace them and uh, plant around them. Um, smaller uh, dots are shrubs uh, which were planted along the, uh, along the uh, woodland and um, there were 11 of them. Oops. I cannot move my slides. I will come in and I can take over. Give me one moment. Oops. Okay, thank you. Okay, just tell me when to hit next if you can see it. So, uh, as you see, the work is in progress, and uh, these are the pictures of uh, the pathway. Uh, we would have the northern view on the left hand side and the southern view on the right hand side. On the right hand side picture you can see a, a car parked. Uh, this is the access to our school. So we are hoping to dress up a little bit this area to just intrigue the students and uh, make them to come and, and uh, take a look at the area. So we are planning to add some birdhouses, uh, bee hotels. We have a gigantic butterfly which will bring some color 
And uh, those uh, uh, stumps, which you see at the upper right picture, these are the seats uh, which are going to be moved to the uh, seating area and uh, our classroom. Next. Lesson learned. Um, so make sure when you're starting planning your project uh, that you have your finances uh, on uh, and uh, ready. What we've done is we created a beautiful design and we'll have a long list of plants which we wanted to plant uh, throughout the area. But because we received our funds really late in the season, when we went to local nurseries, uh, they only had few plants left, so very little diversity to choose from. Uh, timing is also important. We did plant our plants um, late in the spring. So here comes the drought and uh, the temperature and the heat wave. Uh, we do have to water the plants uh, every sing a second day. Invasive species tend to, uh, tend to fight back. Uh, we see them over and over, popping up here and there. We do bi-weekly weeding, which really helps. We're do winning the battle, but uh, still from time to time we're running into them. Uh, we lost some volunteers because of the uh, heat and not everybody likes weeding and watering. Um, hopefully you'll we'll regain uh, them back when the season changes a little bit. And um, plaques not always offer the gratification you need. When you plant them, they're small, they're not flowering, they're not something which you bring straight from the nursery to um, put the colors into uh, your um, garden. So obviously you have to wait a little bit before they establish and become very dense. Uh, the positive notes, um, if you build it, they will come. As soon as we brought our plaques in, the pollinators came and they discovered them and they stayed uh, in this area since then. Um, Virgin Fisher projects also receive uh, funds as soon as we uh, posted our project, uh, our fundraising, uh, even though there was a COVID time, was very smooth and we finished it uh, a week before the deadline. And I would like to say thank you uh, to Sustainable Connecticut and IOB. Uh, without you guys, we will never uh, start our project. And as I said, uh, we invested into it and now we are growing our seed bank, which is going to keep giving. And we had so many ideas, but uh, we were uh, short in money. So you made this happen. The last slide. Um, and this is my last, last slide. So if you would like to learn a little bit more of the Polynesian Pathway North uh, East, uh, please visit our website. We have three uh, different states on it. Uh, we have uh, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and New York. And if you look through the towns, you will find a Greenwich page as well. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm ready to start. And is everything up on the screen? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I can't see my slides. Oh, there they go. Excellent. So um, first, I just want to tell you, I come from a very small town. Uh, Falls Village is in the northwest corner of uh, Connecticut, up where that red heart is. Uh, so we're very close to the Massachusetts border and uh, the New York border. Uh, our population is around 1,300 people, and uh, we're almost 40 square miles in size. We are a little different than Greenwich. Um, over 60% of our uh, community is state forest and wetlands and preserved lands. And then the remainder uh, tends to be an agricultural community. So we have a number of um, uh, farms, many which of our um, organic farms. And um, of our population, about 30% are second homeowners. So we tend to get people who, um, 
pre-COVID anyway, we're weekenders and up here for holidays. Um, our population is actually significantly higher um, in the last few months as many of the weekenders have chosen to stay up here full time. We uh, tend to be a mature community, probably because we're very rural. Um, so uh, the uh, selection of jobs is limited um, and tend to, you know, unless you're a farmer or uh, some sort of tradesperson. Um, so, so that's our community. We obviously have a lot of green around us, but our challenge was more in the area of um, our community, our main street. Our main street was starting to look very shabby. Um, our residents are concerned about their property taxes, so they don't necessarily want to pay taxes for uh, landscaping and maintenance of uh, public areas. We are a mature community, as I mentioned, so you know, we are looking at ways to be more attractive to families. We have very good schools with uh, low student populations. Uh, so we're working on some things to highlight that. We really wanted to invigorate our main street so that it would be a place where people wanted to hang out. Um, and uh, we're looking at some new um, stores there. We recently opened up a, or we attracted somebody who opened up a, a beautiful store that uses all um, local uh, artisans and uh, we're working on a grocery store and a cafe right now. Uh, internet is an issue up here and especially now um, that more people are working from home uh, so we're working on initiatives for that and also expanding our housing options. Um, protecting our environment is really important to our community so it's always a balance because they don't really want development, they want to keep the pristine uh, environment that we have but at the same time they don't want their children to move away or they want more opportunities or they'd like to shop more local um, and it's very important to the community to maintain the town character. Some of the barriers um, to uh, our town's overall success is funding and um, human resources also can be limited and then um, you know working within the culture. So the solution was to hire a community economic developer, that's myself, um, establish a community development corporation, which is a financial instrument so that we could bring more money into the community um, through various sources, um, create a board of directors and also an advisory council. So because we do have so many weekenders, we, have, we do have a lot of talent in this town that normally wasn't involved in the day-to-day -day running. So um, now we have a board of directors with nine people so far and a community or a advisory council um, that will be up to about 20 people of all different kinds of expertise, lawyers, bankers. Um, we have four amazing gardeners, horticulturists, landscapers, um, retail experts and so on. So we're really pulling together a group of expertise. We're also including folks who have been generational um, families here and local farmers um, so that we really do include everyone. We're making sure that we have diversity. Um, we aren't the most diverse community, um, but we are in, inviting um, um, folks who might not normally participate in civic life into uh, the Community Development Corporation's uh, Advisory Council. We're collaborating with as many local organizations as we can, um, and farmers and local businesses. We joined Sustainable CT and some other groups, and, uh, and then also have been working with IOBI, which has been fabulous. Our strategy was to um, work in three areas. One is uh, what we call Main Street Vitality and Charm, and um, seasonal decorations and events, looking at some new low maintenance landscaping, something that would be attractive and interesting, um, restore some vacant municipally owned buildings. Housing is something that we're also focusing on, particularly rentals, and then broadband. We're actually in phase two now, so um, we started last Christmas doing a bit more. Um, we wanted we did this thing, the Festival of Rees, where we had a lot of 
wreath making workshops and people made wreaths and hung them up and we had a contest. So, um, you know, that, that was fun and, and perked up our town in a way that again was um, consistent with the culture. We're not a big lights and, um, you know, artificial decorations kind of a community. The native pollinator gardens fit in really nicely with our overall strategy uh, because we do have an environmental uh, consciousness here. And we also, um, we have our own small water company. And so we want to conserve water. So uh, the native plants um, don't need as much tending. We, you know, don't use pesticides, we don't use herbicides, and again, the native plants are, are built for that. Um, and then we have some various groups exploring some other sort of interesting uh, and innovative social enterprise models for, for, for Main Street. Housing, we're uh, in process on a 16 unit rental, and we've got two broadband projects going, one which is a free Wi-Fi, so that everybody can have internet uh, in the town especially during these times. So um, my, I'm here mostly to talk about community organizing. And so I think it's really important to start small, get your organization together and do some, some little projects so that you can kind of gel as a group and uh, select you know, neutral projects, things that you know, most everybody's gonna like and um, things that have a visible result and uh, the pollinator gardens just fit so perfectly into that. Um, we have various gardens around Main Street and in some of our street islands, which you'll see in a photograph um, shortly. Um, it's also really important to acknowledge your volunteers and really make them feel welcome um, when they come in to start during the process uh, and certainly acknowledge them at the end. And I just try to keep all our projects fun and friendly. We utilize some experts in our community. So Paige is one of the expert gardeners who lives in our community. She's also published. She's a lovely person to work with. And um, I also had three other people um, who really knew the plants and what plants to select and helped us map out, um, you know, they had their CAD drawings and they mapped out the whole layout um, because they're all professionals and that's what they do. And um, we use native plants like um, Echinacea and little blue stem. And uh, so here you can see, this is kind of what it looked like before. The picture on the left, we did pull out um, the weeds and there were some rose bushes in there uh, that required a lot of water, uh, fertilizing and deadheading. Um, the picture to the right is our volunteers uh, we put in over a thousand plugs and um, like Alexandra, you know, at first they didn't look like a lot and we certainly had a few residents that were like, what this? Um, but uh, shortly uh, they grew up and uh, they bloomed and we're getting lots of positive feedback. Um, I don't think you can see it very well in the picture, but we did buy some little signs that say pollinator friendly gardens. Um, this is a town, front of town hall, before and after. So it certainly is, and, and this is relatively new landscaping. So by next year, it'll mature and, you know, certainly be a lot more robust uh, and colorful, but it's, um, you know, a wonderful addition to town hall. We even included in the pots um, some grasses that um, really the pots are the only thing we have to water, except for a couple times during the drought. Um, but we want to be consistent with the theme. And again, I have to credit our landscape uh, people for you know, making sure that things look cohesive, uh, attractive, as well as low maintenance. And then this is a center median. Um, there's about three of them throughout town that started out just very difficult. They're like you know, desert little islands. Um, and now, as you can see to the right, it's, you know, flourishing and it's so lovely when uh, especially now when so many people are walking and riding their bikes and jogging and walking their dogs there's an abundance of butterflies and and you know certainly bees and so on hovering around the various islands and pocket gardens that we have on main street so i guess my takeaways would be um 
acknowledge your volunteers, uh, be organized. So I'm the person that organizes everything. I try to take as much of the um, heavy lifting off my volunteers. Um, we've had, you know, people that have done extraordinary work, um, but I try to take care of the, the other details um, and make it easy and fun for them. And then celebrate success, which has also been a little challenging uh, in this COVID situation. Um, but you know, having a, a barbecue or something like that after a big planting uh, is certainly a way to celebrate, acknowledge the hard work in the heat um, that everybody did. So, so we're we're working around that as as best possible under these circumstances. So, um, thank you. Okay, is everybody's sound back on? I want to make sure we can all hear each other before we get into the question piece. Yes. Yep. yep. Okay, great. So um, I thought it was really interesting to hear how different both of your projects were, how different your communities were, how you took different approaches to the projects. Um, and I have a couple of questions, but we've gotten some really interesting questions from some of the viewers that I wanted to dig into a little. So um, Claire Lafave, I hope I've got your name right, um, asked the question, are there resources you recommend for finding the best the plants to attract pollinators in different regions? Um, I think that's a really great question. I'd be curious to hear how you guys did it. I believe that going to your local extension service through your university, your land grant university, is the best way to find out what plants are native in your area. Your extension agents are there to help you. Uh, make those decisions and they have amazing resources if you are looking for native plant recommendations. So that would be my advice. I'm curious, Felicia and Alexandra, how you chose the plants for your projects. Okay, I'll um, go first. Um, I used experts within our community to make the recommendation and um, I believe that they also consulted the biodiversity website so, um, you know, they mostly work in this area anyway. Um, and uh, so they were familiar with the local native pollinator friendly plants, um, but that is a resource that they let me know about also. Excellent. And Alexander. Um, we have a, a list of our native plants in our area on the Pollinist Pathway website. Also, we use Araban, we use Yukon. Uh, there are so many lists and so many resources. I also want to put a plug in. If you are um, more comfortable going online and seeking out a resource, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, which is located in Austin, Texas, um, maintains a national database of native plants. And you can actually go in. They've got a great search tool where you can enter your location and some of your uh, site parameters. So things like you want it for shade, you want it to be a certain color, you need it to be a certain size, and it will make recommendations that way. Um, that's another really great resource if you just wanna sit behind the computer screen and do it all from there. Yeah. Um, and, um, okay, so that was a question about, I just got a note saying, um, our de Department of Conservation is also a terrific resource for finding the best native plants. That's from Jen at Island Press. Um, okay, so this is a question um, from Molly Daly about putting a pollinator garden in a municipal space. So it says, if we are able to put a pollinator garden in a public space like a cemetery, which was mentioned, this is a property that's usually maintained by a city staff. What challenges did you experience working with those who are responsible for maintenance and what is it important to tell them? I'll be more than happy to answer this question. Um, so in Greenwich, uh, because I do work for the town, I know all the players and it's very easy and we'll work very closely with uh, Parks and Recreation. 
uh, they are man maintaining and managing all those uh, green areas uh, which belongs to the town. Um, so we work together and, and yes, we're sharing weeding, we're sharing watering. Um, we have to make sure that they're comfortable with our project because it's easy to plant, but then maintenance, it's a uh, much harder work. And, and most pro projects which are very wonderful ending up with being uh, weed full and then Parks and Recreation will have to pick up the slack and, and start uh, weeding and working on those areas. So we just would like to make sure that we are responsible and we are committed and uh, we have the uh, crew of volunteers which are going to be on it and we're going to be there when uh, again weeds are needed to be pulled. So we're doing bi-weekly weeding um, every Wednesday um, and we always have volunteers. So, so far we've been uh, doing a very good job. I would, uh, and overall, I think uh, the towns are very open to it because they like beautification. They also will be more than happy to have uh, a group which is going to be uh, maintaining an area. And I'm sure that the, they don't have anything against native plants to be planted uh, within the area. Sure. So, so I would you, second so everything Alexander said. You're creating a budget for the project and you're looking, are you, in addition to addressing some of the startup costs, are you then allocating funds long term to make sure that these types of things that may need city or municipal involvement are addressed over time? I think you have to uh, always uh, think about short and long term um, in terms of the project. So obviously the short term is uh, purchasing the plants, installing them. So we, for example, have volunteers. So we installed most of those plants with volunteers. We have some uh, help from parks and recreation. Um, and then long term, uh, weeding and watering. Obviously we have to purchase a hose uh, to water the plants. Uh, the town is paying for water, but you may actually, uh, in your um, area, um, have a problem with it, and the town may ask who is going to be um, picking up this cost. And then, uh, obviously, weeding, who is going to be doing weeding uh, to make sure that it's free and, and uh, you don't have to include this in your budget. So that's basically all the elements you have to think of. Okay. Felicia, did you have anything to add to that? Um, well, definitely everything that Alexandra said, um, but for us, so we have, uh, we did a test pollinator garden, um, so we have one that's two years old, and the nice thing is that the, the two-year-old garden, um, the weeding is almost none now, right? So the once you put in the plugs, the first year, the weeding is the hardest part, and our town crew does not do weeding. So we have volunteers that are doing weeding, um, but by the second year, there's actually a significant reduction in the time that the town crew has to spend on maintaining any um, landscaping um, if it's if it's planted densely, right? Um, so we have found that uh, we've been able to get volunteers um, like Alexander did for, uh, we don't even do it weekly, um, we, you know, we do a monthly weeding and, um, and that's been working out just fine. The reduction of water, yes, you have to get them established, but after that, there's less. Um, and then the, just the maintenance of the town it has been so dramatically reduced that I think next year we're going to be doing a significant larger swath um, of, of municipal area. So awesome. our, our, our feedback has been very positive from the town crew. Good. Um, uh, Melinda Hemmelgarn asks, can you discuss the problem of attempts to rid invasive species with herbicides? So many other wonderful, otherwise wonderful organizations approve of the use of herbicides for invasive species, but I worry about unintended uh, consequences. Alternatives such as goats or hand weeding is deemed too demanding and costly to hire workers. They see herbicides as an easy way to rid unwanted plants. Um, so I have goats and will tell you that they are amazing for invasive species removal. They will also remove things you don't want them to, like all of our wild blackberries and yeah. things in the yard. Um, and and I, I've written, a, I'm a journalist is my full-time job, and I've written about using goats for invasive species removal and wildfire mitigation and things like that, creating wildfire breaks. And they are really effective. Um, 
they do require a lot of manpower. I think the reality is that herbicides are the easiest and really the most effective way of getting rid of invasive species. It doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, right? Easy and, and effective do not always outweigh the, the costs on the other side. Um, and I talked to people for the book that did burning, they did hand removal. I talked to one um, park, the, the park ranger for one of the parks, and she said they had been doing um, invasive species removal for 20 years. 20 years they'd been trying to tackle in one park the same invasive species and it was happening over and over and over again because they are really hard to get rid of. And so, um, Alexander, you talked about in removing invasive species by hand uh, and I'm curious about, I know it's early days, but how effective that has been and why you decided not to use pesticides and whether there was any pushback on that from people who said it would just be a lot less manpower to just spray them. Uh, right. Uh, so, uh, first of all, if you have uh, volunteers and are uh, not uh, uh, certified pesticide applicators, you cannot require them use uh, pesticides. It's against the law. Um, in Greenwich, we are not using pesticides on school grounds and also uh, public lands. Um, so, um, in some areas, we are if we really have to, but we choose not to. And um, again, you know, when you have volunteers, uh, the only tools you have is your hands and cutting tools. And it is a long-term process, but uh, if you, for example, have the opportunity to replant this area as we, we did, um, now uh, those invasive species are being uh, outcompeted, also supporting with, the, with our weeding. Uh, we're feeling that we will eventually uh, just win the battle and um, we don't have to affect the soil negatively with uh, chemicals. So we're trying our best and, and it is doable and I totally agree that is very time consuming and labor intensive um, and it, sometimes it's really hard to get the volunteers to help you but I think it's worth to uh, pick, a fight, pick the fight. Yeah. yeah I think that there's also and I've not done any kind of analysis on this, to be honest. Um, but I think when you sort of weigh the pros and cons, for example, if you could get rid of all of the invasive species at once with a single herbicide application and plant native species and reestablish that habitat, um, is that more effective than trying for years and years and years to remove invasive species and having habitat take a back seat to the invasive species removal? Um, I don't know that there's a perfect answer. My my preference is always not to use pesticides, but I do understand the argument about the labor um, and you know volunteers. I think prevention is the the most important part of of this whole discussion. And if you know how to plant and you can plan for the future and prevent from uh, invasive species to come to your area and remove them as soon as you see few of them, I think that's the the best approach. Yeah. Felicia? I was going to say it, it wasn't part of this project, but we are also doing invasive species work in our area. Um, we are troubled by uh, bittersweet and kind of like those photos you picked, they just climb right up a tree and they can take it down. So um, historically they had used uh, herbicides and uh, we wanted to try some different tactics. Uh, first we went to um, cutting at the stem and rolling it on, um, rolling on the, um, the, the herbicide um, glyphosate. Um, and, and that worked. Um, but then the next year, um, we just started doing forest mowing. And so that took out large swaths of the plants without any chemicals. And then um, we did replanting. Now, I have a benefit in that we have a high school um, in our community. Uh, that serves seven towns. And about a third of the kids at that high school come from agricultural families and they're doing a um, agricultural pathway. So we have high schoolers that are helping with some of this manual labor as part of their, um, their certification in their agricultural program through the high school. We also have an organic farming school in our town. So I've been collaborating with the organic farming school and the high schools um, uh, program 
And that's been giving us resources, more education, um, certainly beyond what I know, but I'm learning. And uh, we're trying new techniques with a lot of success. Uh, the high school has taken on um, a wild area around the high school that was completely overgrown with bittersweet, barberry, and knotweed. And uh, they're, they're trying different techniques on all three of those plants and, with a lot of success. So, so we're, we're hanging up the, pesticide, the herbicide hat. We've decided not to do that anymore. And uh, you know, it will take time, but we are seeing the difference in the areas. Um, about, it takes about three years of cutting the same plant down to dormant it. Um, but if you can stay on top of it, you, you will see a difference in, in five years. It'll look very different. Awesome. So it's a long so, game. <laughs> we're just at time. Um, there's so many great questions here. Um, and we're just going to ask one more. How do you, Janet Wright wants to know, how do you educate the public who may be more used to a certain landscaped look to attack, accept and protect pollinator plants? That's a great question. I got a lot of pushback at taking out the roses. Um, honestly, it, there were some people who were quite angry. Um, we did it in stages so that we didn't, I would have loved to, I'm like a person that's really into making things happen. So I could have re-landscaped the whole Main Street area in, in you know, one season. Uh, but instead we've done it over three years now. And even now we still have some of the rose bushes in a certain area. Um, so I found for my community, um, you know, taking step by step. Oh, did we lose? We lost Felicia, I think. Did you lose Alexander? me? Oh, yeah, we lost you. There you go. You were taking saying taking step by step. Yes. So um, when the little sprouts, you know, we did the the hundreds of plugs uh, when they were just little baby plugs. Uh, also very negative feedback but once they grew up those same people they you know most of them came around and said thank you this looks wonderful so if you know don't expect everybody in town to embrace it right in the beginning but as long as you bring it along complete your project and show the results uh, some of the naysayers will will compliment you at the end awesome alexandra did you want to add to that um, I think you have to do a lot of advertising. You have to sell your project uh, in the local newspaper and uh, local media. Um, you have to put some signs and uh, part of the uh, design of our uh, pathway is to add those uh, little colorful features which hopefully will intrigue people and uh, look into it and um, be engaged and, and start asking questions. Uh, also, uh, our group is uh, planning to have a little column in our local newspaper to educate people uh, about the pollinators' needs and uh, why pollinators. And uh, over the COVID uh, time, we we'll try to put uh, some information out um, because it is a wonderful time now to focus on it and plan. This is something everybody can do. And even, you know, starting with little improvements around your mailbox where you can plant a few plants for pollinators. Uh, also in a small path areas, um, there are so much opportunities. Uh, and also through um, different um, nursery, local nursery, they started promoting uh, local plants and uh, native plants that are helping us and we're working all together. We also have Audubon and Plant Trust and all the other organizations which are working on education. Now it's a little bit uh, limited because we can't have uh, seminars or big events, but we'll get back to it and we're doing our best. And um, as you said, you know, not everybody will like the look. However, you can find plants which are very attractive and very pollinators friendly. Excellent. Thank you both so much for taking part. I really appreciate it. I hope everybody that's listening in learned a little something and um, we appreciate everyone taking the time out. Yes, thanks. Thank yeah. you all. Thanks the panelists. I'm just gonna make sure everyone sees the book in case you're interested, 30% off 
from Island Press. Grab it if you would like with the code webinar. And if you have an idea for a project, we want you to go to iob.org slash idea and submit your idea. These are two successful ideas that have come to fruition and you can see how amazing they have become. So um, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to everyone who's attended and thank you um, to IOBE for working with us on this. So we'll send out the recording soon. And I'm sorry we can get to everyone's questions, but wonderful day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.